And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jim Knott, President and CEO of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. After the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was passed in the fall of 1964, 1965 saw a dramatic increase in the number of American ground troops in Vietnam. The Battle of the Idring Valley was the first major battle between the U.S. Army and the People's Army of North Vietnam. The two-part battle in the Central Highlands took place from November 14th to 18th, 1965. It was Thanksgiving Day back at home that most Americans first read the headlines about the battle, which was a turning point of sorts with single week casualty numbers exceeding those of the worst weeks of the Korean War. Americans had to face the fact that we really were engaged in a war. Today, we have veterans of the Battle of the Idring Valley recalling what it was like on the front lines. Mr. Vince Cantu was drafted into the Vietnam War in 1963 and became a U.S. Army private in the 1st Battalion of the 7th Cavalry. His battalion was charged with pioneering a new kind of air warfare that the Army termed Air Mobile. Colonel Bruce Crandall is a veteran master Army aviator in both fixed wing aircraft and helicopters and has led more than 900 combat missions during two tours in Vietnam. He was drafted into the Army in 1953 and in early 1965, he joined the Dominican Republic Expeditionary Force as a liaison to the 18th Airborne Corps and later that year commanded the 1st Cavalry Division's Company A, 229th Assault Helicopter Battalion in Vietnam. He has received many awards, including the Bronze Star Medal, the Distinguished Flying Cross with one Oak Leaf Cluster, and the Medal of Honor. Dr. Tone Johnson, Jr. went to Vietnam in 1963 as part of the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division. In November 1965, his unit was ambushed by the Viet Cong in the Idrang Valley and was all but destroyed. He received the Bronze Star for his meritorious achievement and in the recognition of his bravery during the campaign. Later, recovering in the hospital, he was inspired by the care he received to pursue a career in medicine. He later became a family practitioner and started a combat medical training program for infantry soldiers to learn first aid. Colonel Joe Marm enlisted in the Army in 1964 and graduated from Officer Candidate School as a second lieutenant. He was then reassigned to the 1st Cavalry Division and by September 1965 was in Vietnam. In November 1965, his battalion came under fire in the Idrang Valley. Colonel Marm received the Medal of Honor in recognition of his bravery in the campaign. He later successfully petitioned to go back to Vietnam for a second tour, only after signing a waiver stipulating that going back into harm's way was his own choice. And finally, your moderator for this panel, Mr. Joe Galloway. Joe is one of America's premier war and foreign correspondents. He is the recipient of numerous journalism awards but he is also the recipient of the Bronze Star for Valor, the only civilian to receive the honor in, Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, and is the recipient of the Doherty Award, the highest honor the U.S. Army Infantry can present to an individual. Mr. Galloway has co-authored several critically acclaimed books, including We Were Soldiers Once and Young, and its sequel, We Are Soldiers Still, A Journey Back to the Battlefields of Vietnam. The first book was made into the major motion picture, We Were Soldiers, in 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel for the afternoon. It's awful quiet out here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 
I don't know about this being much of a panel discussion, but it sure is a great gathering of my brother soldiers. <laughs> it's been 50 years and five months since we met on a battlefield in the central highlands of Vietnam on the 14th of November, 1965. <clears throat> it was the first major battle for American infantry to run head-on into North Vietnamese regulars, two very fine light infantry, and they went at it tooth and nail. The North Vietnamese were there to kill us all, and we were damn well determined they wouldn't. And... Uh, I met, it's interesting, on the battlefield, on the second day, I was shooting some pictures and I was behind a little bush on one knee and a fellow jumped out of a mortar pit and zigzagged across the edge of the clearing and dove under that bush and all I could see were two eyeballs about the size of saucers under the rim of the helmet. And he said, Joe Galloway, this is Vince Cantu from Refurio. Don't you know me, man? <laughs> Vince Cantu and I graduated in the class of 1959 from Refurio High School, 55 of us. And the next time I saw him was in the middle of the worst battle, the first battle, the worst battle, the bloodiest battle of the entire Vietnam War. He sure looked good. Thank you. And he said, hey Joe, if I live through this, I'm going home to Refurio by Christmas. I said, Vince, go by and see my mom and dad, but don't tell them where we met. <laughs> We, uh, I, I came to be on that battlefield at the engraved invitation of, of Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, who was the battalion commander. I'd marched with his battalion three days before the battle began, a, a long hot walk in the sun to the east of Play Me Special Forces Camp. And I spent the night with him, coldest night I ever spent anywhere in Vietnam, in the Central Highlands at 4,000 feet, and we were all soaking wet from fording a river. And uh, I, I was trying desperately to get into this battle. And there were five other reporters and photographers, including my nemesis, Peter Arnett of the AP, uh, also trying to get in but I had the edge on them because I recognized Colonel Moore's S2, Captain Matt Dillon, and I grabbed him. I said, Matt, I need to get in there. He said, well, I'm going in as soon as it's dark with two helicopters full of ammo, and, but I can't take you unless the Colonel says so. I said, get him on the horn. And he got on the radio, made a report to the Colonel could hear the battle raging in the background over the radio. And he said, oh, and by the way, I've got that reporter Galloway who wants to come in with me. And I'm listening real close. And the colonel said, if he's crazy enough to want to come in here and you got room, bring him. How more believed that the American people had a right to know what their sons were doing and what the army was doing with their sons. And that was, uh, that was how he conducted his uh, operations. The press was always welcome. So I got my, all I had to do then was hide from the other guys until it got near dark and they all flew back to play coup to get a hot meal and a cold bunk. And I got a ride into the pages of history so here we are. Bruce Crandall, tell your story. Well, I made the mistake of taking him back out of there. <laughs> <laughs> he took me in. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I took him in and I also took him back out. That was the uh, first experience we'd had with uh, the helicopters being that influential on the battlefield. The, uh, the infantry had had a lot of experience, but the helicopters were, were just learning uh, our role. And uh, it, uh, I don't know why we waited till after dark to take them in. I prefer to go in when it's daylight and I can see who's shooting at me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, evidently uh, the infantry had some kind of disagreement with that and we went in after dark. My wingman and I flew 14 and a half hours that day. And uh, we were, uh, uh, we brought out 71 people that survived. And we, uh, we got in ammo and water and, and medical supplies into the people on the ground so they survived. It was uh, a very exciting time to say the least. When uh, we'd get shot up, we'd sh shift aircraft and, and uh, uh, start flying an another one. And, and I'd call in uh, to the, the base where the helicopters were and tell them crank one, I'm coming and I'm shot up. And we would do that and we changed aircraft. I think I. We got five, five different aircraft during the day. But we flew the same aircraft a number of times. Duct tape works. <laughs> but uh, we were uh, in, uh, we know what we were doing. I don't want it to sound like we didn't have a real good idea uh, of what we were doing, but we knew. But we also knew that we had to do what we were doing, otherwise the infantry would not survive on the battlefield. And they were ours. They were ours to, 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 to make sure they survived. And uh, my wingman, Ed Freeman, uh, was uh, too tall. In the movie, he was played by uh, Sam Elliott. And uh, no, no, Sam played uh, Sergeant Major. Well, anyhow, Ed was uh, uh, one hell of a good helicopter pilot. And we'd been together for 10 years before we went to Vietnam. Uh, we had uh, five uh, company commanders uh, that uh, were engineer officers that, that worked in uh, topo units, and we'd been together. So we, we knew each other. We trusted each other. We trusted the infantry. We had eight battalions of infantry. And uh, so we, we had a, a marriage a normal re relationship with the infantry. And how more in the 1st to 7th was my uh, heaviest load. They, they were able to find the most trouble. I think they, uh, they knew Custer personally. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Big, Big Ed Freeman uh, uh, received the Medal of Honor uh, first. And that was right, because he's the only one that volunteered to go uh, when I asked for volunteers. And he stayed with me all day and into the night until we brought Joe and them in, and that was the last flight. Cone, you want to take over? I, you, this is one of my <laughs> particular personal heroes. A private of the infantry was shot to doll ribbons on the battlefield, uh, lost an eye, and spending a year in an army hospital, decided that the doctors were his heroes and the army helped him become a doctor and he became a reservist, a reserve officer, then he became a National Guard officer. His last tour of duty was as the Surgeon General of the Texas 36th National Guard Division, and uh, he still practices medicine today in Corpus Christi. Uh, it's amazing the stories that come off a battlefield. Don't? <laughs> well, some of them well, are true. <laughs> that's right. Some of it's true. <laughs> some of it's true. And if you if you can believe the craziest person that that I know is here and one is sitting over here on the other side, it's, uh, you would say part of. I guess part of it is true. <laughs> But uh, I made the, made the mistake myself. I said, Kaisha, 
when I was, uh, when I was uh, 17, uh, coming to the end of my 17th birthday, I went down to uh, sign up for, uh, at the uh, board, and signed up to go in uh, to, for the Army. And I went there, and, uh, and the lady said to me, she said, uh, what's your name? And I looked at her, and I said, I said uh, 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 Tom Johnson. And she looked at me, and that's not in relationship to the Tom that was here before. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I saw, and I, she said, no, that's not your name. And I said, uh, yes, sir, it is. That's my name. And she said, no, that's not your name. And then she said, well, again, I'll give you one more chance. What's your name? And then I said, uh, Junior Johnson. And then she said, oh, that's not your name. And I said, and I looked at her, and I said, well, so I said, uh, she said, your name is Tone, and, uh, Tone, and for that, I'm going to send you in today. So she told me to go outside and sit down, and I went outside, and I sit down in the waiting room for a little bit, and I, and, um, I got up, and, and, I, and I walked out, and I said, well, I, I can beat her at this. I'm going to go over and sign up myself. So I went and signed up as a volunteer to go into the Army. And so we went in, and, uh, and on that on that day uh, that we were asked to support, uh, you know, the uh, first, uh, the support uh, in the field, I looked at it as, gosh, we're just going to go out. We're going to take our mortars because I was in 11C10. 11C10 is heavy weapon infantry. And I said, gosh, I'm going to go out and we're just going to support them. We're going we're gonna to lay, put up, set up our mortars and lay down fire for them. And that's what we're going to do. And, uh, so we got out there, and some, uh, I, I always call those uh, helicopter pilots kind of crazy because uh, he was going out, and, uh, and he's ducking around the treetops, and, uh, and then we get to the place where we was going to go in, and uh, he, uh, he just came in real low, and he says, now, boys, get your tails off the plane, off the chopper. And, and he's, he's flying this higher, higher than this, table, this uh, podium here. He's hiding, uh, he's flying higher than that. And, uh, he's, and he said, well, what are we gonna do? He said, go ahead and, and jump out. Just get out, get out now because I'm taking fire and I need you to just get out so I can take off. And so uh, we, ju we jumped out and nevertheless, we was in a rice paddy. And of course, in a, in a rice paddy in Vietnam, you, it's uh, a lot of water plus some other things that we, I, we, don't, we don't want to probably talk about. <laughs> so, so we you jumped your pants is what happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we, we did, and, uh, and we were taking heavy fire. And then, so I told the guys at the, at the time, I said, guys, I said, I think, I think we, are, we were sent here to take the fire off of uh, uh, the... Uh, the others, and he said, uh, and everybody was saying, well, what are we going to do? So we actually headed for the wood line, and then we started, uh, we started to lay down fire. And that was, uh, that was a, a tough day. When I stood there, and I was looking through the elephant grass, and, uh, and I pulled the elephant grass back, and right before me, there was a guy who looked about my age or younger, and he was looking right at me, and I was looking right at him. And neither one of us was firing at either. We were just staring at each other. And then all of a sudden, a large noise out of nowhere. And, and when I woke up, uh, what, four hours, five hours later, um, I, thought I, was, I thought I was dead, I say, because uh, I couldn't see anything and I was just laying there. So I, and, then all I could think of, boy, you know, heaven certainly is dark because I can't see a thing. Because I, and so I laid there for a while, and then something told me to reach up and check, and, and check yourself. And so I started just checking my feeling myself, and I said, I'm all right. But I felt my face, and my face like, felt like somebody had caked mud all over my face. But fortunate for me, uh, it was my own blood, and it was covering up my eyes, and I couldn't see. So when I... I finally opened up and uh, I got the blood off. I could, I could see, uh, and then I noticed that, gosh, you know, I'm here and I'm here alone. And I could hear firing from the distance. And so 
we decided, well, uh, well, I decided that I will go and try to find some others and we will get together and we will try to uh, uh, develop a circle of fire. And uh, we, we did that and we fought throughout the, throughout the evening and through the night and to the next day. Uh, we was laying down as much fire as we could and then at night time, I said, gosh, you know, uh, we was there and, and the Vietnamese was coming and, and we saw them coming and one of the guys says, well, what are, you, what are we gonna do? And I said, you know, uh, sorry to say, but I said, hell if I know, I'm just a private. <laughs> and uh, you know, and uh, we look at everybody looked around and they said, "Oh, you the ranking is private." So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I said, "Well, well, okay, well, well, let's uh, let's yeah, try to you know find uh, something to eat because it's in the middle of the night and we and we haven't had anything to eat and it's, we've we've been at this since about uh, 9 a.m. in the morning." And I say, well, and so we, we did that and we were sitting down and, and waiting for uh, things to kind of clear down, uh, settle down a little bit. And we noticed that, uh, gosh, the Vietnamese started coming again. And I say, nobody fights at night. And uh, this, this, is, this is silly. And, uh, and, and all I could see was the, the tracer ammo and uh, we had trace ammo, but I didn't think the Vietnamese had trace ammo, uh, or the, the Viet Cong had trace ammo. So we were, we were just looking at that, and I was laying on my back, and I was watching this trace ammo come so across my face. And, and uh, so finally I said, you know what, I think is somebody from our side is shooting our way. And so we start to holler a little bit, and then and finally they said, who's there? And we say, it's, uh, is Dog Company. Actually, that's Delta Company for all of you people who don't know about it. And they say, uh, well, we, we're here, but uh, we have no ammo. And they say, well, you better stay down because the Viet Cong is right up on you. So we, we, we stayed down for a little bit, and then we decided, well, we got to get back in the fight. And so we decided to, to move out and start doing, doing what we could. It was a tough night, and we went through that and, and through the part of the day of the next day. And, um, and when I first knew uh, Joe, I said, well, well he, he came to Corpus and said, and I didn't know he lived in a refugio, uh, or uh, actually uh, he lived out on the bay, you know. And, I, and he, uh, he told me one day, he said, uh, well, we're gonna have a meeting and up in Refugio, we're gonna come up and, uh, and we're gonna and we're gonna discuss some things. And so we went up there. Then he told me he had written a book, and I had I'd already seen the movie. So and he asked me to to come and and, uh, and look at it and and everything. And then he showed me. He said, "Gosh, you know your name is in the book." And I said, "He said, because I couldn't get to you to get anything else. I you put your your name is in the book." And I I looked at it and I said. Wow, my name is in the book. <laughs> but, That's something uh, for the ranking as private. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, actually, I, you know, I, I, well, I did. We, I lived through everything. I lived through the war, and I came out. And I, as Joe said, I, I went back to school, and the, and the army was, uh, uh, I was nice enough to. Uh, let me uh, join the Army Health Professional Program and, uh, and go to school. And I went to school and, and I uh, decided I would pay them back by going back into the Army. I went back into the Army and served. And, and, uh, and uh, then I got out and I say, well, and I went into public health service and, and I served as a commander in the public health service for several years. And I, and I got out and I said, why, well, what am I gonna do? Well. So I decided, well, I'll go into the guard, and I went into the guard. And I served in the Texas Guard for uh, about 30, 30 years in the Texas Guard. And when I got out, uh, I asked uh, Governor Rick Perry, who was in the governor, and he said, well, uh, Tone, you're such, a, you're such a good fellow. 
We won't, we, can't, we won't make you a brigadier, but I guess we'll make you an admiral in the Texas, what? In, in the Texas State Navy. And I said, <laughs> what is this? I'm an army officer. Yeah. But <laughs> no, no uh, thank it you. was really tough. Let's, let's move along we'll move over, over there to, to, Vince. to, Vince. to my, to my Vince old Cantu classmate, is... Vince Cantu. Vince, tell us your story. Well, Joe, I shouldn't have been there in the first place. <laughs> Me too. You, <laughs> now, President None. Kennedy had passed a proclamation, no married men. At that time, I was married, and I had a little girl, Mary Lou. And so I felt safe. But then Uncle Sam came knocking, and uh, he said, hey, I'm an issue. So I gathered all my papers, took them to Victoria, because that's where the recruiting station was. And I said, hey, you can't take me in. So I put all the information in front of them. I said, I'm sorry, but we need to run out of food. You're in? Well, you're in? I said, okay. So I was sure I wasn't going to pass, but three guys went. One didn't make it because intelligence. The other one, he was too fat. So <laughs> I looked out. Who was, <laughs> who was the one who had no intelligence? <laughs> you had, you had, you had. <laughs> I should have played like I had no intelligence. Yeah. I should have done that. But anyway, they took me in. Now, the way I met Joe, Sergeant Montgomery was my platoon sergeant, and Sergeant Mueller, who was German descent, was my platoon sergeant, I mean, squad leader. And he was sitting there in the fire and all around us, and big old tree behind him. I said, Sergeant, what are you doing sitting here? I said, came to, I came to do this. I said, my, I just had a dollar when we were coming back. We went over there and they used this, Maurice Rose. I said, and I haven't seen her. And he kept on crying, so I said, get behind the tree. And I put him behind the tree, and I, and I rushed over to Sergeant Montgomery. I said, Sergeant, Mung Sergeant Mueller can't function. He said, well, can't you send him back to the back area? So I went back to the back area, and I took him, and I went to Sergeant M Montgomery. He said, can't do you, the squad is yours. <laughs> now, now that next ship coming, send some of your men to pick up the dead and put them in a the chopper. So I went there and I waited and I said, these are the guys that I've been on two years together. Because when they took us in there, I needed 10 days left in the army. So how can I get their confidence, you know, send, send them out and I, and I could get to step back in where it feels safe. So I made up my mind to, hey, I'll just tell them to follow me. So when the chopper came in, they all followed me and we put the dead body in it in the chopper. And then I see Joe, of course I didn't know it was him, come from behind a bush and kneel down and take a picture, but I thought he was gonna shoot me. So I drove down into the elephant grass and the elephant grass is real tall. At that time, it was real tall because Nobody had stepped on it. So I kept looking, and I was wondering why he didn't have a rifle. I kept looking, and I, in my mind, I said, I know that guy. And it, then it was real hot. Joe at the time had a lot of freckles. So I looked at him, <laughs> said, yeah, that's Joe Galloway. <laughs> so I crawled over toward him, and I said, Joe Galloway. He looked up. I said, Vince can too. You remember me? <coughs> and uh, big old grin. So we crawled towards each other. I said, what are you doing? He said, I work for UPI. I said, well, you better get your rifle, because they shoot live bullets. <laughs> <laughs> and then how I met Joe in the field. And uh, he took a picture of me that been all over the place. And that has open up my world. I took, I, I played with a group called the Saints and Sinners, 10 members and their wife. I took them to the referee and we played there. It had been 40 years since I played. And um, we had a big crowd. So after the, the dance and the music went to Moyes Cafe. It was a real popular 
cafe is mentioned in a lot of books and everybody goes there. So here we are, about 35 of us. We all eat after the deal. Of course, I don't have that kind of money to pay for all those guys. So I said, well, whatever we need, we'll just divide it into 10 and go pay. So uh, I went to Dale Moya, the owner of the restaurant, and I said, Dale, uh, I need the bill. She said, Vince, it's already been taken care of. I said, who? He said, they want to stay anonymous. So that's the way my life been going. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah, anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Playing with my hearing aids. I like that. Uh, Vince, you earn more than a free meal at Moya's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did. Did you hear that? Because yes. I couldn't. That's what I was. Yes. Yeah, boy. There's too many chopper pal uh, days. <laughs> Joe Marm, <laughs> Colonel Marm, uh, tell us your story. It's a, an honor for me to be here. There's many Vietnam veterans out there, so I can't tell any lies. <laughs> <laughs> Never stopped us. <laughs> I would have been drafted. They had a draft back in the 60s, so I enlisted under the college option program and went through basic training, advanced individual training, and then OCS. And we did KP and we did guard duty, which they don't do now. <laughs> but uh, it made me appreciate uh, being, uh, being a soldier. And I graduated from OCS and went into, uh, went into, into the uh, ranger school. And that was my best preparation for Vietnam. Nine straight weeks of intensive uh, training up in the mountains of North Georgia and down in the Everglades of Florida. And uh, we had a big formation right before we graduated. And they called out about 50 names of our, of our classmates and said, your order is now being changed. You can make one phone call home. You're going to uh, Fort Benning. I was supposed to go to Fort Jackson in, 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 in South Carolina and push basic trainees. But uh, uh, I went in and signed in, and uh, we were there just a month, and we headed to Vietnam. My first uh, sea voyage went over on the USS Maurice Rose. We took a bus from uh, Fort Benning to Charleston and boarded the, uh, the Rose and, uh, and headed, uh, headed west. Went through the Panama Canal up to California and across the Pacific, went through a typhoon. That's and right. the whole division had to get over there. 15,000 soldiers and 400 plus helicopters all had to get over there. And the, the helicopters were on uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, they took, we took a mule. Uh, Colonel Stockton, uh, they gave him a mule uh, during the, 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 the testing phase of, the, of the, the 11th Air Assault when they were testing the helicopters to see if they would work. And it proved to be a very, very successful division a very good division, but it was very expensive. They were able to outmaneuver the 82nd and the 101st during the war games that they were participating in. But uh, Colonel, he wasn't supposed to do it, but he took his, uh, his mule. They gave, it, they gave it to him as a gag gift. And he called his, his mule after his wife's name, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> he, got, he got to Vietnam and, and Maggie, uh, the generals told uh, Stockton, I don't want Maggie on uh, my Chinook helicopter. And so he had to sling load Maggie underneath his command helicopter to our base camp up in the central highlands of Von K. <laughs> Maggie came to a bad end. Yeah. <laughs> she, uh, she was uh, killed one night by a sentry from the 7th Cavalry. Uh, and uh, Sergeant Major Plumley reported this fact to Colonel Moore, who held his hands over his head and said, what, what did you do? And he said, well, sir, I loaded Maggie aboard the chow truck and they delivered her back to the ninth. <laughs> he <laughs> said, why did we kill her? He said, she were challenged, sir, and didn't know the countersign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you and I, we was on the same, uh, went on the same time on the USS Maurice Rose. Yes, sir. We rode that same 
Same so, mule. Yeah. <laughs> go, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. But we were in the 7th Cavalry, and uh, whose lineage goes back to General George Armstrong Custer. Yeah. And uh, there at uh, LZ X-Ray, we thought we were in another little bighorn, surrounded and outnumbered. But we had a lot of assets Custer didn't have. We had the entire division ready to give us support. So that was very, 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 very uh, fortunate that we had that. But I, I was, that was my first job uh, right out of uh, my, my Army training and uh, as a, a rifle platoon leader in A Company. We were the second company in. Bravo Company came in first and started uh, looking for the enemy. And uh, our company, A Company, came in about 10.30 on a Sunday morning, the 14th of December. And, uh, November. and one, of, uh, one of the platoons of uh, Bravo Company got uh, separated and surrounded by the enemy, and the rest of the company had to pull back. Uh, my company commander, Tony Nadal, said, Marm, take your platoon and link up with uh, Bravo Company. They're going to make an attempt to get back up to to that, that platoon that was trapped. So we started, uh, we started doing it, but we were taking casualties uh, from the, uh, the enemy in, into our front, and we, we weren't able to, to do it on that first attempt. So we pulled back, and we we're gonna make a second attempt with two, uh, two companies minus the platoon that was trapped, B Company and, and A Company. And uh, so we started out, and we put artillery and mortar fire uh, in front of us, trying to soften up the, uh, the uh, the front as we move forward. But uh, everybody has their own little firefight. In front of me was a, uh, uh, and it was elephant grass and shrubs and trees. It wasn't heavy jungle like you think of in Vietnam. But uh, this one solidified rock anthill is about seven feet tall and just looked like a big anthill with shrubs and trees around it. It was right in the front of my platoon's uh, sector. In the heat of battle, I told one of my, one of my men to uh, throw a grenade, uh, run up there and throw a grenade over the top, but he, trying to use sign language because he couldn't hear me that well, but he thought I meant throw it from where we're at, and he did, and it landed in front of the bunker, and it went off, and it didn't do much damage, so uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we kept moving forward, and uh, I told another one of my men to shoot a bazooka. It's called a light anti-tank weapon. It's a one-shot disposable tank killing weapon that we had. It was a new weapon for Vietnam. And uh, my soldier uh, tried to shoot it, but it was a misfire. So uh, what you do with misfire, I, I took the, the weapon from him and closed it up and, and opened it up again and shot it. And it, boy, it went right into that, that big rock, solidified rock and it made a big boom and a big cloud of dust. And I, it really picked up our morale. And we started moved, moving forward again, but uh, we were taking too much, uh, too much, uh, fire from the enemy, we had to stop. It was about 30 meters away that I said, rather than waste any more time because it was starting to get dark, we wanted to get to that platoon before, the, uh, before it got too dark. So I told my men to hold their fire and, and not to shoot me up. That kind of worried me a little bit. So I ran forward about 30 meters, got to the, the, the solidified rock anthill and threw a grenade over the top went around to the left side of it and silenced some more uh, North Vietnamese that were, that were still trying to shoot me. When the uh, bunker was silenced is when uh, I, turned to, I turned to my men to tell them to, let's go, we got to get to the platoon when I got shot somewhere from a bad, uh, one of the North Vietnamese further in the background there. And it kind of ruined my day. I, uh, the bullet uh, sh shattered my left jaw uh, went in, went in the left jaw and deflected down and came out underneath my right, uh, my right jaw. And uh, I didn't have. You're supposed to, supposed to have a uh, a medic with you. There's a sign attached to you. One of my sergeants, uh, a squad leader, was a medic in the Korean War and uh, had switched MOSs and was an infantry guy now. So he was doing double duty, carrying the the aid the aid bag, and uh, taking care of his squad. And so he came up to me and patched me up, and a couple of my soldiers. Uh, carried me back to the rear, and so I was—I was a walking wounded. It didn't have to. It just kind of had to help me back a little bit. But it, uh, and this guy took me out later that night, <laughs> before uh, before last light. I, he still owes me a pig. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hog farm in North Carolina. So. <laughs> he bled all over my helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> We had tremendous soldiers, in that they'd been training together, and some of them like had 10 days left, and many of them had a week left, or you know, 
two or three <laughs> months left, and we're in that battle, fighting uh, right alongside of us. And we're yeah, a cross-section yeah. of America in terms of all races and religions. And, and, and uh, I had E-5s with uh, uh, buck sergeants with uh, 10 years of service uh, that, were, that were working with me. And uh, so I just had a tremendous platoon of, of, you know, of uh, about 35 guys. In our company, we lost 11 in those three days of battle, uh, 11 killed in action. And uh, we went in with 450. The whole battalion went in with 450, and we had 79 soldiers killed in action after three days of intense fighting and 121 uh, wounded in action. But uh, we, were, uh, we were blessed with uh, just good, good soldiers and NCOs. It I'm should be uh, noted here that the overall picture was that the until this point until this battle the war had pretty much been confined to american advisors with vietnamese troops and the casualties had been accordingly fairly small a couple a week something like that uh, although all casualties are painful at this point with this battle and the succeeding battle at Landing Zone Albany by our sister battalion, the second of the Seventh Cavalry, uh, 205 Americans were killed in four days and uh, approximately 300 wounded out of two battalions. Uh, the entire campaign from mid-October to mid-November, 305 American dead. When these figures uh, hit Washington, uh, there was a considerable concern in the White House, considerable concern by President Johnson. Uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara uh, was uh, Robert Strange McNamara, aptly named, uh, was at NATO in Brussels and President Johnson told him, get your butt to Vietnam and find out what the hell is going on over there. More or less in those words, I think. And uh, McNamara came over, he took briefings at the embassy, he picked up Westmoreland and they flew up to An Khe and took briefings from uh, Colonel Moore, from uh, General, <laughs> Brigadier General, uh, Major General uh, Harry Kennard, who was the division commander. And uh, on the plane home, dated uh, 30 November 1965, McNamara wrote a top secret eyes only memorandum to the president. And on 15 December 1965, uh, President Johnson called a meeting of his wise men at the White House, they had a two-day session. When Johnson walked into the cabinet room for the beginning of this meeting, he had a copy of McNamara's memo in his hand. And he shook it at him and said, Bob, you mean to tell me that no matter what I do in Vietnam, I can't win that war? And McNamara looked at him and shook his head yes. The memo said, roughly speaking, uh, that the North Vietnamese have not only met our escalation of the war, they have exceeded it. And we are at a decision point. We can decide to find whatever diplomatic cover is available and get out of this war, out of this place or we give General Westmoreland the 200,000 more troops he's asking for, in which case by early 1967, we will reach a military stalemate at a much higher level of violence and approximately 1,000 a month American dead. He was wrong for a bean counter. It was actually would turn out to be 3,000 a month at its height. Uh, but knowing this and having the memo and they sat there and they talked about it for two days, they then voted 
unanimously for option two, give Westmoreland the 200,000 more troops and go for a military stalemate at a much higher level of violence. Uh, it's one of the more curious moments in American history. At that time, we had 1,100 Americans who had lost their lives in Vietnam and the war would drag on for the better part of 10 more years and 58,290 names would be engraved on the black granite wall in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I wanted you to see that larger picture and there's one more part of it. It seems to me and, and others who've studied it that this battle in the aftermath uh, General Kennard wanted permission to pursue the fleeing North Vietnamese enemy across this la line on a map into Cambodia where they had their sanctuaries and where we knew they were and where we could see their arms dumps and their men and this was kicked all the way back to Washington to the Pentagon and then to the White House and the answer came back, you dare not pursue those people into Cambodia, period. It will not be allowed. At that moment, I believe we telegraphed a message to General Jop and the bosses in Hanoi that they now had and would have for the rest of the war strategic initiative. They would decide when and where we would fight and how long the battle would last. And all they had to do at the end of it was cross a line and they were time out. We we're gonna have time to rest, refit, reinforce, and we'll come back when we're ready to fight you again. So it, it's in many ways very depressing uh, to look at the blood that was lost, the sacrifices that were made, and see that it was all going nowhere. We, we were not going to win. I don't even think we could define what victory would look like in Vietnam. So that's my, my opinion. Uh, it's my story and I'm sticking with it. You guys are welcome to Check as we, in. As we expanded from 100,000 to 500,000, I went back in 69. I didn't have the seasoned NCOs like I had in 65, just because the Army had expanded so, so rapidly and, and so fast, and, uh, which was a shame. We had, great, uh, uh, we had great soldiers, and many of them were promoted right from out of basic training. They had a, 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 uh, an, an NCO course and they would come out, they were called, uh, many of the Vietnam vets will know, they were called shake a bake yeah, they were, 90 they, day wonders. They were <laughs> that, great that, soldiers, yeah. they just didn't have yeah. a, lot of, a lot of experience. A lot of experience, yeah. Joe got and drafted, then, and so did I. And they sent me 12 miles from home after they drafted me and expected me to behave, which was <laughs> expectations they didn't have back home. <laughs> Anyhow, my first sergeant, called me and my buddy in and he said, you two guys are too effed up to even be in the army. And you might make corporal someday and I don't want that on my conscience, but you make good second lieutenants. Now sign this document. <laughs> <laughs> sign this document and get the hell out of my unit. And that gave me a career in the army. I'd screw up and move up. <laughs> but, uh, he made yeah. colonel. No, I'm colonel. Yeah, yeah. I generally well, made colonel. Well, I, I remember uh, Joe was talking about a relationship to Cambodia because one day we were sent out to do a firing mission. And it says, well, you are you got a firing mission, and your mission, uh, the Vietnamese are, are uh, coming across the border, and you, uh, your firing mission is to go out and, and uh, fire at them and make sure. And so we go out, and we are sitting there uh, waiting, and... and 
And uh, we see the Vietnamese sitting up on the other side in Cambodia. We could see them. We actually, they were sitting here. And, they, and we were setting up our, our mortars and well, getting ready and putting down base plates. And we noticed that the Vietnamese, were, all they were doing was uh, uh, putting the mortar base on a, uh, the mortar tube on a rock. And they, and they were firing with the mortar tube on a rock. And we were sitting there uh, firing with our, going to fire ours with, and someone said, uh, you can't fire across the border. And, and there we were wait, uh, waiting and, and uh, wanting to fire, but, and the Vietnamese was just firing at us. And then, and then we, looked, uh, we looked back in the rear and we noticed that, well, there was uh, uh, B-52 bombers were unloading. And you could hear, if you've ever been in a place where you could hear when they're unloading, you just hear a rumbling coming across and it's coming right at you. And you could hear that rumbling coming, coming in. And, and, and so we didn't know what to do was to go across the border and be with the Vietnamese <laughs> or the Viet Cong. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of caught, but, but it, was, it was something else to watch. And I remember having, uh, Telling the guys uh, one night when we were uh, we were on the land on our our backside there, wondering what we were going to do next, and I and so and I always uh, uh, carried uh, a lot of uh, uh, grenades with me, and I said, "Well, guys, only one thing we can do." I said, "Here is one grenade. Pull the pin, and uh, and we'll just lay down on the ground because we didn't have any more ammo or anything else." I said, "We'll just lay down on the ground." And then, and when they come up and uh, they reach and get you, you just hand them the grenade. And so, <laughs> so we, we did that. And the next, by, and uh, noon, I said afternoon of the next day, well, uh, we heard the choppers and we said, gosh, you know, okay, the choppers are coming. And, uh, you know, and uh, they were coming under fire. I said, well, but they, they still were coming in. And uh, so we, we said, well, gosh, we, uh, we were just lying there, we said, everybody said, I said, well, take off your grenades and then, and then throw it out in, in, uh, in the woods. And we, we uh, started to do that. And, and I had mine in my hand and my hand was so tight. And, and I, I tell my wife some now, that's why I can't move my hand very much now because I said, I had that grenade so tight, I was holding it and I couldn't open my hand. And so, and I was wondering what I was going to do when the first, the first sergeant was the first one to come up, Sergeant Major Bowles. We had uh, 30, uh, 35 guys and, and only five of us survived that day. And uh, so we were there waiting and when I heard his name and when he called and, he's, and, uh, and I said, uh, Johnson, and he said, oh, he came, started coming across. And when he started coming across, I, I looked and I saw some little helmets, and I know the only people who were tall enough to stand in the elephant grass with helmets on their head would <laughs> happen to be Vietnamese I, or Viet Cong, and I said, oh my God, we are being overran. And so, and I, I held my grenade to throw, and the sergeant major said, oh, no, no, no. And, uh, cause I was getting ready to throw the grenade and I went like that and it wouldn't come out of my hand. It was just stuck in my hand, so he had to come over and, and uh, take it out, and then yeah, at that time he said, well, we're gonna take you back, you, you've been wounded. Uh, and, and to my surprise, I said, well, I know I've been wounded once. And he says, yeah, you know, you got a, you got a fragmentation wound on, on your eye, it went right through your face. And I said, really? Hey, and Joe, he said, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we did get that platoon the next day. Uh, a young E-5, uh, Ernie Savage, took over and put a ring of steel all around that platoon uh, that night. So that was very, his whole chain of command was killed or wounded and he, uh, he survived with the help of the medic, Doc Lose. Uh, they, they survived and we were able to get up to him the next day and get him out of there. Yeah. One, well, one thing that I want to get across to this audience is that we never should have a draft again. The draft did yes, nothing except change the place where some of our guys went to jail. <laughs> the local chair for the judge could tell a young man that you either go in the army or go to jail, and we had the largest stockades we've ever had. And you don't gain anything by having a draft. You don't get equity. And when you talk about it, 
we've got some of the finest young men in our military today, and they're doing a great job when they're allowed to do it. But the draft is a terrible way to try to solve a problem uh, that can't be solved in any manner, shape, or form like that. Uh, I was drafted. I didn't have to go. But if I had it to go again, I'd do it. And most of your regular Army types were good men. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Were very good. Yeah. And, and those so, I served with in the Guard when we yeah. went to the first Gulf War, where they, they were a very good bunch. They did, they did very well. I think and, we uh, have run to the fine. end of our string here, gentlemen. Yeah. So, I got my point in. You, you got your point <laughs> across. You don't see? So thank you all for your attention. Yes, thank you. Thank you.